In this evolutionary psychology video, we'll be looking at behaviors in terms of survival. So first of all, we can think about some of the context. So modern understanding of genetic versus communicable diseases are absent, and there would have been little contact without group individuals, and those interactions would have been quite confusing, aggressive, or violent. And also, those interactions would have been more likely to introduce a new disease. So we can think of this as an Maybe this is responsible for our, what appears to be our innate desire to create in-groups and out-groups. So an anecdote actually from my family, when my parents used to live in West Africa, they had a, a manservant who kind of worked in the house and took care of things. And in the news, there was a bunch of information about Northern Ireland. And he was a curious guy, so he asked my parents, like, what's going on in Northern Ireland? Why are, the, what, you know, why are there terrorist acts happening in Northern Ireland? And so my parents explained that in Ireland there was a split where you have lots of Ireland is Catholic and Northern Ireland is Protestant, but there are Catholic individuals in Northern Ireland and there's a lot of conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants. And this guy actually had a really hard time understanding that because his response was, well, aren't they all the same tribe? Aren't they all just Irish? So to him, religion was actually not an important factor at all for deciding if you belonged to a certain group or if you didn't like other groups. To him, it was the tribe that was most important. And in the US, right, we actually focus a lot more on religion. We don't really have tribes in the same way. And so it's not like there's some sort of objective criteria that we use to sort ourselves, but we do tend to sort ourselves. And we use different groups to do that based on what is common to our area or what's important. There's a really interesting set of experiments look at uh, using babies and puppets that gets at what might be behind a little bit of this in-group or out-group behavior. Rather than talk about this in the PowerPoint here, I've put a link to a different video showing this experiment in a different format. So changing topics and looking at something else here. So we have a hypothesis from evolutionary psychology. The widespread phobia of snakes is an evolutionary adaptation because snakes are dangerous and fearing them conferred a survival benefit, right? So here's Indiana Jones. He's afraid of snakes, as are many people. And this sounds good, right? So we kind of have a hardwired fear of snakes because they're dangerous. That makes sense. But again, we want to test this. How do we separate that from cultural factors like stories where snakes are the bad guys or are evil. And maybe that's why we don't like snakes. So how do we distinguish between cultural reasons why we don't like snakes and maybe hardwired evolutionary psychology reasons why we don't like snakes? So there is evidence that fear can depend on the evolutionary histories in other species. So fear conditioning is when you present a stimulus to an animal and then follow it by a negative result. And then you can learn how quickly it takes the animal to learn that that first stimulus is something they should then generate fear from, right? Because they would then they would then fear the negative thing that's about to happen to them. So this is if you've seen the Simpsons episode where they shock each other with electric shocks, that's often how this is done. So maybe you present an odor to rats, and then a few seconds after the smell, you shock them with electric shock, or you show a a picture to a bird, a few seconds later you shock them with electric shock. So it turns out that rats are very good at learning that a smell is something to, then, to get afraid of if it's going to be followed by an electric shock, and you can measure fear by heart rate. But it's much more difficult to train them to become afraid of visual signals, whereas in birds they're much easier to train for visual signals and they're much worse at associating fear with odors. And this kind of works, in a sense, for their evolutionary history. Right? Rats are very focused on smell and odors, and this is how they explore the world. Birds don't have such a great sense of smell. They explore the world more with their vision. Now, of course, these guys can see, and these guys can smell. So you can create cues that they're able to sense, but there's something about rats focusing and associating smell with fear and birds associating visual things with fear rather than the other way around. So the brain biology of different organisms can be influenced by their evolutionary histories um, in a way that's associated with fear differently. So we're going to look to see if we have a similar thing in humans. So if this model here is true, right, we're afraid of snakes, 
then we should have um, a more innate fear for old context threats than for modern threats, right? So for the snake example, if it's because of our evolutionary history, we should be able to associate snakes with fear more than some sort of other cultural thing with fear. Whereas if snakes are just hated because of cultural factors, we should be able to associate anything with something fearful with the negative stimulus just as much as snakes. So here's a couple of studies. So fear conditioning works better for ancient threats than for modern ones. So this is actually an experiment where they hooked people up to electric shock machines and you show them a picture and then a fraction of a second later you shock them. You can detect when their unconscious physiological system reacts and causes fear. And it turns out that when you show them pictures of cars and then shock them, or show them pictures of power outlets and then shock them, which are real threats in everyday society, they don't as quickly generate fear compared to showing them pictures of snakes followed by electric shocks. And again, this is actually happening in the microsecond scale, so this is the unconscious fear happening before the person actually perhaps even processes what's in the picture and them getting shocked. So our brains are better at associating ancient threats with a modern punishment than they are with associating modern threats with an immediate punishment. There are also studies showing that people are better at detecting old objects than modern ones. So if you've ever seen this game where it's like spot the number of differences between these sides, if you create a system where the differences are old things like animals, people are better at picking up those differences than when you create a system where the differences are new things. So here's an example of how that works. What they did is you show people a blank screen, then a picture, then a blank screen, then a picture that has a difference in it, then a blank screen, and just alternate back and forth between these differences, and you measure how long it takes them to spot the difference. And it turns out that if you have a picture like this with a person in it, or a picture like this with an animal, or a picture like this with an animal, people are much faster at recognizing the differences between these pictures, with and without those objects, than they are at detecting a modern object, or a modern object, or a modern object being removed or being present, even when these objects maybe have higher contrast with their background, right? This elephant does not have a high contrast with the, the rest of the picture. This person certainly doesn't but people are much faster at recognizing, oh, that's the thing that's different in these pictures than they are at recognizing, like, this is the thing that's different, or this is the thing that's different. And so there's not really another good explanation for why we are better at recognizing changes in things like this, right, ancient things, animals and people, that we would have been selected to deal with than we are at noticing changes like this which are things we're unfamiliar with, then our brains having a history of selection to focus on animals. And this is consistent with that previous study showing that our brains appear to be much better at associating fear with animals or old threats we were exposed to rather than modern ones. Changing topics again, again associated with survival. Here's a hypothesis. So the bias or disgust we have against foreign people, unattractive people, or disfigured people is due to an adaptation to avoid communicable diseases. So again, that sounds reasonable, right? So we are hardwired to not like people that are different because we're trying to avoid diseases. We don't like people that look like they have problems, even if it's not a disease that we're going to catch, right? So he, he did not do very well with everybody else, even though he wasn't giving them any diseases. But again, how do we separate that from cultural factors? How do we separate a hardwired predisposition to not like different from a cultural factor that has maybe told us to not like different? So if this is true, if it's a biological phenomenon, the prejudices should be increased when the risk from infectious disease is increased versus if they're just cultural factors and they're not associated with an explicit description of disease maybe we wouldn't expect to see this bias increased. So here are some studies. So when primed to be concerned about health issues, people have stronger anti-immigrant attitudes. So this is, if you give them a series of questionnaires and at the end of the questionnaire you ask them questions about immigrants, but at the beginning of the questionnaire you have two different forms. One form 
asks them a bunch of questions about diseases and health, and another form asks them questions about some other issue. In the first case, they'll actually indicate stronger anti-immigrant responses than in the second case. So if you make people think about diseases or health, they end up having stronger anti-immigrant attitudes when people are primed and thinking about disease, even though they don't realize it, they then have a stronger bias against foreigners. And consistent with this, so women have a more ethnocentric, or you can think about racist, attitudes in their first trimester of pregnancy. You give women questionnaires that measure racism, they score as more racist in the first trimester of pregnancy when disease would actually have the largest threat to their reproduction versus later in pregnancy when diseases that they get are less likely to kill their offspring. And again, these are non-conscious things, right? This is primed to think about health issues. This is not having questions that say, oh, immigrants have diseases, what do you think? It's just asking about, like, uh, what do you think about vaccinations for kids? Or what do you think about cold? Or did you get a cold in the last year? And then much later asking about immigrants. And this is not asking them about their kids at all. This is just taking measurements in different stages of pregnancy. So when we're primed to think this way, or when we're questioned at certain stages, we can see a link between disease and opinions of people from outgroups. That's not a conscious one that's more likely to be hardwired into our brains.